Good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are having a good Wednesday and trade deadline is passed. It's over. It was fun. A lot of stuff happened. Not a lot to do with the Seahawks, but a lot of stuff happened. And the door is now closed on improving the team right now. The door is closed on trading your draft picks away. The door is closed on selling off players for extra draft picks. We know what we have. And we have a pretty good idea of what other teams have as well. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off our first day post-trade deadline by talking about some options in the upcoming 2023 draft. Obviously, this has been a very hot, hot-button issue <clears throat> for Seahawks fans ever since we found out we were going to be holding Denver's top two picks in the 2023 draft in conjunction with our own. I think that a lot of people thought we would be getting one high pick in the first and another lower pick in the first. We just didn't know which pick was going to come from which source. And as we sit here right now, a little less than halfway through the season, looking at where Denver's pick is right now, you can see that Denver has a pick that is sitting at number 10 right now. Seattle has a pick that is currently sitting at 22. And there's a ton of time for this stuff to change, but we're going to just start with this top pick, this, this number 10 overall pick from Denver. If you take a look at Denver, what they've been through eight games, what they've done, you take a look at their remaining schedule, you take a look at what they've done well and what they've done poorly, and you take a look at what they did at the trade deadline, I am going to go out on a little bit of a limb here and say I feel very confident we are getting a top 10 pick from the Broncos. The, remainder, the remaining schedule is really hard. They have a lot of injuries, a lot of which are two players that are not going to come back. They traded one of their best defensive pieces in Bradley Chubb and replaced him with a decent player like Jacob Martin. Um, they, they have probably the worst offense in the NFL, and their quarterback is playing through multiple injuries and is clearly, it's not working. Just nothing on that offense is really working right now. So it seems pretty elementary to me to deduce that based off the information we have right now we are getting a top 10 pick and I don't know where it's going to be in that top 10 honestly looking at Denver's remaining schedule it would not surprise me if they went something like 4 and 13 they they could go that far down and that would probably get you a top three pick if they win an extra game or maybe two extra games you're still looking at something in that four to ten range but bottom line is this Denver is almost certainly giving Seattle a top 10 pick. So, let's talk about that pick. What could we use it on if not a quarterback? Because that's kind of the idea of this little series I'm going to put together on this channel. We, for a while, assumed that the likely usage of our top draft pick in 2023 would go towards a new quarterback. But a few things have happened. Things have changed. Geno Smith has been playing better than a lot of people thought. Geno's been playing at a very high level, and I'm just going to say it, the 2023 quarterback class does not look as good as advertised. This was supposed to be a super deep, super talented class. Right now, I only see one blue chipper, and he is a blue chipper, but he's not a historic prospect either. And everyone else, like, I like a lot of them. I, I, there are guys that I really am into. But I'm not seeing a slam dunk home run top three pick from any of them except for C.J. Stroud. And bottom line is C.J. Stroud is going to probably end up with one of the truly quarterback needy teams that will be picking in the top three. In fact, honestly, I think it'll go, I think C.J. Stroud goes to whoever goes uh, top one. So if we don't use that pick on a quarterback because of Geno and because the class is not as strong as hoped, like, it's not just about the guys at the top, by the way. Guys like Tyler Van Dyke, Will Rogers, Devin Leary, Grayson McCall, like, they're, some of them are interesting. Some of them are good. But none of them blew up to that point where they could go in the top 10, I don't think. <clears throat> Maybe one of them will get hyped up between now and the draft, but as of right now, I don't see it. So let, let's think about this for a second here. If we don't use our top 10 pick, our assumed top 10 pick on a QB. I don't think we're going to use it on offense. We're not going to use a top 10 pick on a running back. There's one running back in this class who might go top 10, but we just took Ken Walker. Uh, 
I don't believe we're going to take a wide receiver. There are a couple nice receivers in this class, but um, we have a ton of money invested into our top two receivers. We use two tight end and three tight end sets more than anyone else in the NFL. It doesn't make sense for us to invest so much capital into a third receiver who doesn't even see the field that often, even if we are giving up on a guy like Dwayne Eskridge. Um, tight end, no, we have three quality, or at least capable tight ends under contract in 2023. Uh, I don't see any need to bring in a super duper star. There are a couple of really good tight ends in this class, but no. Uh, we're not going to spend a top 10 pick on a tackle because we got our tackles last year. And interior offensive line, I just don't know if I see a guard or center prospect worthy of being picked in that top 10 right now. So bottom line is this, that top 10 pick, probably not going to offense. So that leaves your defense. I don't think we're going to spend a top 10 pick on a corner. We usually don't do that anyway, and we our corner spot is looking pretty good right now with Kobe, Woolen, Jackson, and Trey Brown. So not corner and probably not safety either. Maybe safety, but I don't know who that safety would be. I don't see a top 10 caliber safety. So basically, by process of elimination, it's reasonable to assume that if we get that top 10 pick, and if we decide to commit to Geno, or commit to some path that doesn't involve using a top 10 pick on one, we're getting somebody in the front seven. We are getting a front seven player. So I wanted to briefly talk about, we're not going to do super deep dives yet, that's going to be for the off season, but in this video I just want to briefly touch on the five guys who would go approximately in that area of the draft who would make sense for the Seahawks. So we're going to take a look at a handful of guys who are going to be going in that general range of the draft just to kind of introduce them. <clears throat> We've got a few weeks of college football left. As a viewer you can zone in on these guys in particular. These are guys that I've been talking about for a while. This is not anything new or ground earth shattering, but I really want to focus in on what these guys are and what they could potentially add to the Seahawks. So we're going to just look at the guys who look like they could go in the top 10 because that's what this is about, right? Our top 10 pick. <clears throat> so here are my five guys to keep an eye on for the rest of the college football season and as the off season uh, begins. So first guy, this is the slam dunk home run, forget about it. He's going top five, guaranteed. Honestly, I think he's going top three, guaranteed. If he went number one overall, it would not surprise me. It's Will Anderson from Alabama. He's an edge rusher. Uh, this guy is an absolute phenom, set the college world on fire in 2021. Hasn't been quite as dominant in 2022, but he's shown the flashes that you want. And... I put his uh, measurables, his uh, stats on the screen here. You guys can take a look at it. But even beyond just the stats, you have games like like uh, when, when Alabama played Texas A&M earlier this year, Will Anderson was credited with 11 pressures by himself in that game. And right now he is doing it purely on physical talent. He is doing it purely on just his innate physical ability. He's not doing it with amazing pass rush moves. He's not doing it with some tremendous understanding of cerebral defensive football. He is just overpowering people. So he is probably going to get much better once he picks up the mental side of the game. This guy, great pick to go number one overall. So he's going to be hard to get. In fact, every single professional mock draft since early August has Will Anderson as a top five pick. A lot of them have him in the top two. Many have him in the top one. This is a guy who should fit multiple types of defenses. Six foot four, 240 pounds. He's probably got to put on some weight, but he wouldn't have to put on much to be an edge rusher in our 3 4 hybrid defense, right? Uh, by the way, the age I listed for these players is the age they are going to be when they make their presumed NFL debut in September of 2023. Will Anderson is 21 right now, but he will be 22 when he makes his NFL debut next season. So. Will Anderson is currently the crown jewel of the non-quarterbacks in this draft, and he may be the crown jewel of the entire draft even with quarterbacks. This is an edge player who had over 100 tackles in 2021, 17 and a half sacks, 31 tackles in the backfield. 
absolutely dominant, could not be stopped by pretty much anyone. So far this year, he's slowed down a little bit, but we still have several games left to play. So that's top dog. Next guy I want to talk about is Jalen Carter, Georgia defensive tackle. Now, if this guy were to play in the Seahawks defense, I think he would most likely be a defensive end rather than a nose tackle if he was playing in a 3-4. Now, in a 4-3, he would obviously project well to being a, uh, a, I believe, a 3-tech. But he could add some weight, maybe he'll be a 1-tech as well. There are a few different ways his career can go when he gets to the pros. He's a 6'3", 305 pounds, going to be 22 when he makes his NFL debut. Um, 2020, he got his feet wet for that Georgia defense. And in 2021, he had a very strong year, 37 tackles, 8.5 tackles for loss, 3 sacks. 2022, he hasn't been putting up the numbers. He is still playing very well, reflected in how good that Georgia defense is, with him probably being the best player and most important player on it. But he hasn't put up the dominant numbers. But nevertheless, this guy remains highly coveted by pretty much every professional mock drafter. Jalen Carter has gone top 12 in every professional NFL mock draft tracked by uh, NFL mock draft database since late September. His average mock draft position is number four. So this guy is probably, I'm going to probably say he's a top five pick. He does play a position that occasionally gets devalued a little bit compared to things like edge and quarterback. So maybe he bumps into the lower part of the top 10. But this is probably a top 10 pick. And if you could get him with a top 10 pick, you would immediately add a lot of credibility to your defensive line. Uh, the stats are not super flashy. It, it really kind of depends on what your plans are on defense going forward past 2022. But Jalen Carter, definitely a great player. Miles Murphy is the third guy I want to talk about here. He's a Clemson edge rusher, another edge rusher. This is probably the guy who is going to get the most gas behind him for going to, uh, going to Seattle in future mock drafts. That's my prediction. You're going to see a lot of mock drafts in the coming months with Miles Murphy going to Seattle with that Denver pick. So this guy's a little bit younger than the first two players we looked at. He's going to be 21 when he makes his NFL debut. He's 6'5 and 275 pounds, which is if he wants to play edge in a 3-4, which we would presumably want from him, then he would probably need to drop some weight and be able to play in space a little bit more. But we see players do that. Uh, I would... Um, I would certainly rather have a player like Miles Murphy, who is, you know, big and has a big frame, try to change his body shape over somebody like a, a Bryce Young trying to change his body shape because he's just so much smaller. But it is worth noting that as of right now, he's a little bit heavier than you would like your uh, edge player to be if you're running a 3-4. But he's had three really good seasons for Clemson. Uh, 2021, his best season so far, 39 tackles, 14 and a half for loss, eight sacks. He's forced six fumbles in his career, so he's got a nose for ripping the ball out. And he's in the middle of a really nice 2022 campaign as well. 26 tackles, five and a half sacks, nine tackles for loss, and more uh, more stuff to come. And he has gone top 13 in every professional NFL mock draft since mid-October. So that's like, you know, two, two and a half weeks at this point. So this guy is almost certainly going to go in that top 13. His average mock draft position right now is fifth overall. So I, I don't know if he actually goes in the top five, but it's within the realm of possibility, and I seriously doubt he's getting out of the top ten as long as he keeps it up and plays at the level he's playing at for the rest of the season. So that's Miles Murphy. Definitely going to get some traction with him going to Seattle, I think, especially with Daryl Taylor not playing great this year um, and there being something of a need at edge rusher for the Seahawks that has developed as this season has gone on. Uh, <clears throat> the fourth guy I want to take a look at here is another Clemson player. It's Brian Brissy. And this is another guy that I think is going to get heavily linked to the Seahawks in mocks. Um, the first two guys, Will Anderson and uh, Jalen Carter, I have a feeling people are going to have them going in the top five. And I think Seattle's pick in most mocks is going to fall between six and ten. So I don't think you'll see as much of them, but a guy like a Miles Murphy... And a guy like a Brian Brissy, it could definitely happen. This is another defensive lineman, defensive tackle. He's uh, 6'5", 300 pounds, 21 years old when he makes his NFL debut, so still very young. 
Uh, I don't know exactly what he would do in the NFL on the defensive line, but whatever he does, I'm sure he'll be great. Um, this guy has posted some very nice seasons for Clemson. The issue is his availability. He blew up on the scene in 2020 with 23 tackles, six and a half for loss, four sacks as a defensive tackle. Really good stuff from Brissy that first year. And then in 2021, he only played like four games, and so far this year he's played five. He had some kind of a heart issue. He had some sort of a medical con uh, uh, concern. I can't remember the exact details of what went, went down with Brian Brissy, but he's had some scares, and he's been held out of a lot of games. But it seems like he's passed it, and there is no denying the talent. He just hasn't been able to put up the stats. And his talent is so undeniable despite the lack of stats. I mean, he's got nine tackles so far in 2022. That's, you know, not, not impressing anybody probably. He has gone top 20 in every professional NFL mock draft I could find since mid-October, so two and a half weeks, with one exception. One mock draft I found had him going like 23rd overall. And... I mean, the database of mock drafts on NFL Mock Draft Database is pretty big. So we're talking dozens of mock drafts putting him in the top 20. His average mock draft position is 8. So this is another guy who has a very good chance of going in that top 10. And he'll be a guy that is linked heavily to Seattle, I believe. Last guy I want to talk about here is Trenton Simpson, another Clemson player. So that's three of them. Call him the Dirty Trio from uh, Clemson, I guess. I don't know. I'm, I suck at nicknames. But... Trenton Simpson is going to be the uh, fifth and maybe the least compelling of these defensive front seven options in the top ten. But I got to talk about this guy because I think he is by far the best linebacker in this class. This is the kind of linebacker you would be okay with spending high draft capital on. I know everyone watching this video puked a little bit when I, they heard me suggest taking an off-ball linebacker with the top ten pick. But Trenton Simpson is the kind of off-ball linebacker who can really take over a game. This is not like a Jordan Brooks thing. No, Trenton Simpson can cover. Trenton Simpson can play multiple positions. He, he looks like a safety sometimes. This guy's 6'3", 230 pounds. Only going to be 22 when he gets to the NFL. A little bit older than the last two guys we looked at, but still very young. He's had three productive seasons. Whenever I watch Clemson games this year, I constantly see him around the play. I constantly see him around the ball. He's had seasons where he's had six and a half sacks and 12 and a half tackles for loss. First year, he had four sacks. Um, this, this is a guy who makes plays in the backfield all the time. This guy is really special. This is the kind of linebacker you want. Now, he's gone top 20 in about 80% of professional mock drafts since early to mid-October. So we're talking like three weeks, maybe three and a half. Average mock draft position is 18. So you might not need to spend the top 10 pick on him, admittedly, right? So you might be able to say, let's, let's trade back, pick up an extra pick, and get Trenton Simpson around 16, 17. Or maybe with our other first round pick, we trade up a little bit or hope he falls to us. Maybe we're picking around 22, 23. We hope he falls or we trade up to make sure we get him if we really want him. So if we took Trenton Simpson in the top 10, I would definitely have my concerns about it. It's not a slam dunk like Brissy is or Murphy is or certainly Will Anderson or Jalen Carter. But Trenton Simpson, this is the kind of linebacker who can change your defense. This is the kind of linebacker who has enough impact to where you can take him in the top 10 and not feel terrible about it. He's great in, he's great in coverage, like I said. He can rush the passer, get to the quarterback, makes plays in the backfield. He's just all over the place. He, You watch him play at Clemson, it almost feels like he's a bigger Jamal Adams. And without the injuries, hopefully, <laughs> obviously. But it almost feels like the dude could play a dual role of linebacker and safety. Because he can do it all. And he's athletic enough to make that happen. So there are going to be one or two other guys who maybe get people's attention in the coming weeks in college football who maybe have a chance at going top 10 in the draft who are playing in that front seven. Right now, these are the five guys that I'm really looking at here. Right now, these are the five guys who I think we should zero in on here until Denver proves that they can string together some wins. When that happens, maybe we need to curb our enthusiasm a little bit. But right now, I think 
there's a very good chance one of these five guys ends up in Seattle per via, excuse me, via Denver's pick in the 2023 draft. So, I mean, that's pretty exciting, right? So let me know what you guys think. Did I miss anybody? Do you have any preferences? Do you think anybody's going to shoot up the draft boards in the last few weeks? Do you guys think that maybe I'm missing somebody here? Just let me know. Let me know. Um, I, I, I got to say that I think these uh, three Clemson guys are going to get heavily linked to Seattle in the coming weeks. So, I mean, in some ways they already are. I think Brian Brissy gets mocked to Seattle more than anybody as is. All right, I'll see you guys later. Go Hawks. And that is my introduction to the 2023 NFL Draft, assuming the Seahawks don't actually need a quarterback, which may be the truth.